that go live button right now. And, uh, hopefully by the time I get my glasses clean, we'll know what's going on out there, huh? Ooh. And I'm all splattered with plant juice running the spring string trimmer all afternoon. Oy. But I managed to get the plant and bug juice knocked off me and get out of here. Oh, hello there, good people. Hi, it's Jason with Green Country Ag Reports. You're here Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m., so it must be time for another live stream. Hope y'all are doing okay out there. 105 degrees outside, outside today in Oklahoma. Hmm. I don't know what the heat index was. It was it was up there. Vicky saying, "Glad to know the watercress is doing well. It is. I spread it around. I, I moved. I have some out there in the in the bird bath, and I've got some in our our little pools. I've got on the side of the driveway." Uh, there's only one colony of it in the pools beside the driveway at the moment, and there's some that got started in one of the, the pools beside the house. So it's in three different locations at the moment. The first big bit of it, whenever it came in, um, it was just, you know, large amounts of foliage there. And I didn't catch it when it first arrived, so it sat in the mailbox over the day, whenever it arrived. So it was in the mailbox getting hot and... Uh, that probably wasn't good for it, but it managed to recover, recover okay. All right. Fiddle around with the guitar for a minute, let some people catch up. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, making the choice between depressing ecosystems or stimulating ecosystems and active versus passive pest control. Okay, so how's everybody doing? See, Faith joined us. Vicky's with us. And Diana is with us. We got a couple of people with us tonight. All right. All right. Hope you can hear okay. I've got the fan going and the and the, and, and the air conditioner going. Because it's just just too hot. Lori is rolled in the house tonight. Hi. <laughs> now you're glad you sent the stuffed box, huh? Well, what I've discovered is probably whenever I start shipping plant live plants again, after the heat breaks, I'll start shipping live mm -hmm. plants again. But uh, what I should be doing is getting out a marker. I've got one over here on the side. Getting out a marker. And whenever I, I'm getting ready to, to just ship plants or something like that, just mark on the outside of the box, do not leave in a mailbox live plants. Maybe they'll pay attention. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But we're going to start putting that on the on the packaging because if it's if it's just the wrong kind of day, then you can wind up losing plants that way. All right. <laughs> Mary, is, Mary is now... Uh, has, has now got an earworm for, for, for Buddy Holly every day. Uh, we were watching uh, the, the second Good Omens, second season of Good Omens. This turned out weird. I mean, it was always weird, but it turned out weirder. All righty. So let's start out with, with some defining, let's start out with defining some terms, active Pest control versus passive pest control, and really active, active. No, no spoilers, Faith. No, no spoilers. I'll, I'll, I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what happens. Um, but you kind of knew, it's based on a book by Terry Pratchett, it was going to get weird, and, and also it's British, so yeah, it was going to get weird. 
All right, so we know when we're going out to deal with pests and deal, deal, deal with weeds, this is a lot of work, a lot of effort. Uh, we're either grabbing pesticides and running out there to spray our plants to kill the bugs or maybe spray them so that the bugs don't come and, and, and attack them. Or perhaps we're busy uh, with some mechanical means. Maybe we're, we're wrapping tinfoil around the base of our, of our squash plants to keep the vine borers away. Or we're putting tents up so that, so that the, the moths and the caterpillars don't get in. All of these are active measures. We're doing something to stop the pets. If we're going out there to weed, if we're going out there to use the string trimmer like I was doing today for the areas that still have grass. Yes, I know it's great. It's crazy. We still have grass. Um, I'll tell you more about why I was string trimming here in a minute. <clears throat> All of these are active measures. We're doing work in order to deal with pest pressure or weed pressure or whatever this thing is, whatever the Whatever it is that we're trying to work with, we're doing work to do it. We're spending it calories. We're spending energy. Now, if if you can just pick up your phone and, you know, hi, pizza delivery? Yeah, I'd like two extra large uh, double cheese. And um, can, can I get them with the stuffed crust, with the, the cheese inside the crust? That'd be great. Thanks. Okay. So as long as you can do that, hey, no problem. You can get all the calories you want. You can spend them however you want. And shoot. A lot of us, we need to spend a few extra calories, you know, here and there because, you know, middle age spread and all that. You got to get your exercise in. <clears throat> but imagine we have to try to produce food for real and what we get for calories we're getting from our gardens. Now the question is, how much of this extra work, extra calorie expenditure do we want to be doing to get the same result? And of course, the, the temptation is to grab the chemicals to deal with the weeds, to grab the chemicals to deal with the pests because... Let's face it, going out there with a, a jar of soapy water and grabbing bugs and throw them in the jar of soapy water is, that's that's time consuming. If you want to be able to deal with pests in some sort of natural organic way, and you still have the mindset of row crops like a farmhouse. Fortunately, we don't have the mindset here of row crops like a farmhouse because we understand that that works when you have machines to do, to, to do a lot of the work for you. But whenever it's just you doing the work, you need something that's a little bit more ergonomic, something a little bit more human-centric and not machine-centric. Straight rows that can be mechanically harvested, that's machine thinking. We need something that works for humans. All right, so what's going to work for us? What's going to let us lighten our load? What's going to allow us to move from active pest control to passive pest control? And also, incidentally, active and passive weed control. I'm going to start out by talking about weed control first. And we'll, we'll move in to, 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 to pest control. So if you look behind me, you'll see this picture. It's a it's a picture of a pecan tree. It's got a it's got a, a whimsical gnome sitting there in the crotch of the tree going, hello. You know, it's supposed to be kind of a substitute for me, your six foot tall garden gnome. Um, the pecan tree is there because of a need that we had to control a weed, oddly enough. So we're going to tell you that story tonight. Mary says her legs still hurt from all the weeding that she was helping out with. Mm. <laughs> Rock and roll. Huh? Okay, so we live in, well, we don't live in Sandsbury's. We live in, on the west side of Tulsa. Not really in Tulsa. I think Tulsa is this, this one street right over here in front of us. That's Tulsa. So we're just the very last street on Tulsa, just on the outskirts of town. The next municipal area is over here a few miles at Sand Springs. So Tulsa's over there across the road from us, and Sand Springs is over there in a couple miles. And we're in this area that's Tulsa County, not Tulsa City, but Tulsa County. And it's on the Arkansas River. And this area is just full of sandbirds. This 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 sand burr sticker grass stuff. I'm not sure what this what what the proper name for it is. It's a it's a thick tough grass that likes a lot of heat, and it produces these 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 sharp spiny little thorn stickers that are on on, on, on the surface of the seeds that stick to animal fur. They stick to your pants. They stick to your shoes. If you fall down in them, they stick to you uh, rather painfully. They have little barbs on their tips and. And, and that's how they carry the seeds around. They, they spread everywhere. The ground is very sandy. 
moist or not, not, not moist, but sandy, well-draining soil in most cases. Um, and then whenever you get the heat on, that's whenever these things just take off and grow. Drought doesn't seem to bother them. They don't care. They're, they're going to grow and they're going to do their thing, which is spread out these really tough, um, really tough stems flat against the ground. And then eventually they'll, they'll pop up with their, their seed heads. Painful stickers these things are. No fun. And for a while, back whenever we still had a yard and a lawn, like ordinary normal people, granted it was not a, a terrific lawn, it was a mixture of grass and other things, uh, probably about 19 different species of plant I counted one day while I was intently looking at the yard going, what in the world is growing here? Uh, there were about 19 different species of plants growing, about three or four of them were grasses and the rest were other things. Um, so while we had a lawn, I attempted to, to deal with this, this, this sticker grass here, this, this horrible sand burr that we were dealing with. And I, I would go out there early in the morning with the, the fork, you know, the, the one that they, they sell you so you can pull up dandelions. I wasn't pulling up dandelions. I was pulling up, I was pulling up the sticker grass. Every single, every single day I go out there and I get it and I get it and get it. And then, and then finally I go, okay. I think I got all of it. And then a couple of weeks later, here it starts coming up again. And there's the stickers. They're coming up too. And they all come on at once. All the little ones with the stickers that were on them that were growing parallel to the ground going, <laughs> we're going to hide from them, right? All the way through the year, we're hiding here in the grass. We're down low so you can't see us. And now that the heat is out, it's in that in, in, in those those hellish days of, of, uh, of August, from July to August, this this particular time right now, very, very hot in Northeast Oklahoma. All of a sudden they pop up and this is the time that you really don't want to be outside at all doing anything because it's just too hot. So all these stickers are now up and of course the, the, the sharp spines are everywhere and it's just it's just horrible. I, I, I keep um, I keep a pair of pliers usually near my desk so that if I get one stuck in me, I can grab it with the pliers because you can't use your fingers because then you'll get two more spines in your fingers. You know, one in this finger, one in that finger, and they aren't coming out of either one of those without a fight either. So you grab with the pliers and yank the thing out and it hurts, but it it it, it gets the thing and then we, we, we take it and dispose of it. So a lot of work went into trying to figure out how to fight these things. And, and sure enough, yeah, a cat manages to, to, to come from somewhere else because they're, they're all over this river bottom. They'll come from somewhere else, wander into the yard, and the next thing we know, ooh, we got a whole new colony of them again. So there's just no getting rid of these things, no getting rid of them at all. And, and I know, I know people will say, there's a, there's, a, there's a poison you can spray to get rid of those. You know, there's a lawn trimmer you can put on there, and get rid of those, Maria, take care of those sticker grass where it comes up. You know, huh? I know. I just don't want to use that sort of stuff. <clears throat> but there was an observation that we made uh, with regards to those, those particular sticker plants. And the observation is, wherever you've got trees and shade, they don't want to grow. So it seemed to me that the simplest solution would be to plant shady trees, which would probably shape for the house, which would be good because it will reduce our electric bill. And it will also eventually herald the end of the sticker grass, and it will all be gone. Well, under this pecan tree behind me, well, this is a picture of the pecan tree that's behind me. Under this particular pecan tree, wherever its shade is, is fairly consistent throughout the day, we have no more stickers. We can now walk through the front yard where this pecan tree has its shade barefoot, aside from the risk of scorpions and snakes and stuff like that. But we can plant, we, we could walk barefoot underneath there. And so, yeah, yeah, all we do is plant trees and so it begins, right? <laughs> and so by altering the environment, we have created a situation where the sticker grass does not want to grow. So the, I don't have to do anything at all now to stop stickers from growing in the front yard where this tree is. The presence of this tree is passively controlling the stickers. I don't have to go out there and actively expend a lot of work trying to get rid of these things before they get stuck in my soft and tender bits. So that's an example of how we 
used a passive method of, of control, in this case of a weed, to accomplish our ends instead of expending discontinuous amounts of, of, of active effort constantly trying to get rid of the sticker grass, which is, as we've noticed, just going to get reseeded by animals passing through eventually anyway. And yeah, um, purse lane loses to the sticker grass. Yep. Unfortunately. <laughs> well, the, they wind up occupying, well, they wind up occupying two different, two different areas. If we're talking about, you know, we're looking for something to fill a niche and something and something to occupy a layer, right? And the sticker grass will, will absolutely dominate that ground cover layer layer space. They can get lower than anything. And so even though Purse Lane, yes, also wants to be be a ground cover, the sticker manages to to outcompete it by either going under or going over. And it can it can do either. It's versatile. Those purse, purse, purse lane spreads. That's its only trick. And Mary says, yes, we figured out that the shade controls the grasshoppers, too. So once again, environmental. We, we altered the environment so that a certain pest, in this case grasshoppers, don't want to live here either. The grasshoppers don't want to live in the shade. They want to live in the woods. They like living on the edges. So we have lots of grasshoppers on the edges. And currently, uh, the issue we're having with grasshoppers in the front yard is I've got ducks that can eat grasshoppers. There are other birds that will come along and eat them, wild ones, and I've been trying to attract those, but most of those need a consistent area to make their nests in on the ground that's sheltered all the time. So uh, thick thickets, uh, brush piles, and things of that nature. I've got some brush piles put up here and there, but uh, they're kind of new, and uh, the thrushes that are going to want to go and take shelter in those areas that would also want to eat the uh, the grasshoppers and other larger insects. They haven't quite been enticed yet. Uh, maybe give them some more time, more trees, more shelter, and more surface water, or just those things being present a little bit longer so they can get used to the idea of coming over and visiting. That may get us there. Hmm. Well, that's just the thing, isn't it? The sticker grass does serve a purpose. In areas where you where, where you have soil, like we have here, and weather conditions, like we have here, some of your normal regular grasses that ordinarily would be out there in the summer holding the soil down, preventing erosion and stuff like that, they can't hang. It gets too hot, it gets too dry. Because that soil, sandy and it's well draining, but if it doesn't have any organic matter in it, the water, the moisture doesn't re isn't retained in it. So you need something that can handle the drought when it comes. And so the sticker grass can do that. That's just not what I would choose. <laughs> so we were dealing with stickers a lot this uh, this past week, uh, past weekend going into Monday. Mary got to stay home an extra day. Uh, we were dealing with those. We were doing some weeding in the... Uh, in the, in the more brightly lit areas that we don't have shade in yet. And so I was making my way ahead of Mary. Mary was pulling the pulling the, the, the bulk weeds behind me. And I was making my way ahead of her with a bucket, pulling the stickers out and getting rid of the, the sharp pokey bits. And then whenever we came to spots where, where, where we had them on the ground, I've got a little technique for, for picking them up. And actually, I have a couple of techniques for picking them up. The, the, the quick and easy if I don't want to go if I don't want to go and, and, and get any extra materials is just to take my, my, my fingers and, and and lightly touch the, the, the stickers so they stick in that the upper layer of skin right there on the surface. Now I mean it doesn't go deep enough to actually hurt you have to, you, know, but you have to pull them out and throw them away afterwards. And you can do that with a couple but if you're in a hurry you have a tendency to tap them too hard and then they puncture and then they're painful and nobody likes that. So the method that we that we came up with last year was taking uh, an old bed sheet that was that was beyond salvageable and dragging it across the ground and just picking up all the stickers in that and then rolling it up and throwing that away. Uh, but we didn't have any bed sheets to spare. And another thing you could use is old gunny sacks. I didn't really want to. Uh, go buy gunny sacks to have them to to use for that purpose if i had them as as, as surplus from from buying feed maybe i'd use it for that but uh we didn't have those so 
we have cardboard. And we've got cardboard from boxes that are bought from online purchases. They show up, boxes and boxes stacked to the rafters. What do we do with all the boxes? And so you know, we do a lot of things with the boxes. I use them for, for sheet mulching. I use them for sometimes for, for creating new packaging to, to ship trees and plants and other things. Oh, by the way, we have a, an online nursery at www.greencountryagroforestry.com. You can buy heirloom seeds there. You can buy trees and plants there. Uh, we'll start shipping our trees whenever they go dormant in the fall, and you can get those to plant before spring arrives wherever you are so you can have your own forest garden. So there's, there's the ad. Um, but sometimes we will use that cardboard to make packages. But I found another use for it. All you have to do is take a strip of park cardboard that you may not want to use for anything else, lay it out in, in, in the rain so it gets wet, and it'll start to delaminate. It'll, it'll come apart. And while it's, while it's still fairly wet, you just pull it apart, and you'll have one side that has all those little corrugations on it, and the other side is this little strip of cardboard. You can use that for sheet mulching if you want, or use it for fire starting, or use it for anything else you can use cardboard for. But the side with the corrugations, while it's still moist, while, the, while those corrugations are still damp, they're nice and soft. And you've got a fairly firm cardboard back on the other side to keep the, the stickers from piercing all the way through and getting to your fingers like they can with a piece of cloth or a sheet. And now you take that and you just put it on the ground, pat it down so the stickers stick to it. And then wherever you pick it up, the stickers stick to the cardboard. You fold it up so you don't get any stuck in your fingers. And you toss those in the fire like you're supposed to. Ta-da. So that was what I was busy doing while, while Mary was running around pulling up the weeds and all the others. So we're going to do a little bit of soil modification over there where, where, where we just finished the, the, the weeding. <laughs> we're tactical. <laughs> As Sass Press Red is saying, and I agree, anything has thorns or stickers there to protect the land until the soil is established for the next level of growth or, or to t protect that plant itself. Because a lot of the times those pioneers, the things that we want to come in there and do the early work of doing soil repair are, are full of protein, uh, especially nitrogen fixtures. Nitrogen fixtures usually high in protein. High in protein means good food source for ruminants. That means grazing pressure unless it has some means of protecting itself. And so that's the reason why we have a lot of these plants that, that show up whenever the soil is disturbed or damaged and they have thorns and they have they have they have spines and they have stickers. So I'm sitting here with a couple of stickers stuck in my hand and I don't know if I'm going to release the video or not. But I was I, I was talking about that 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 bit in Genesis where where we're uh, discussing how the land is cursed because of the actions of man and it brings forth the thorns and the thistles and. I actually don't agree with that. I, I, I don't think that the thorns and the thistles and, and these plants are a curse upon the land. I don't think that that the creator is so weak that the hands of man can undo creation. However, there are consequences. There are definitely consequences. I don't I don't believe that, that our creator punishes or curses us. I doesn't need to. <laughs> it's the, our creator is the creator of the universe, so there are consequences for for, for allowing your land to become uh, from, so, so despoiled. Now, from our perspective, yes, it may seem like a curse, but it's not a curse. It's a consequence, and knowing the difference is by of vital importance. Because if you think of it in terms of a curse and you think of it in terms of a punishment, punishment, then you misunderstand the nature of the creator and you just misunderstand the relationship of man to nature which is really fundamental. So it's consequence, it's not a curse. So we were spending our week in correcting consequences, essentially is what we were doing. So these are the things that show up to repair the land. <laughs> Mary says, I'd look it up, but I'm eating chicken. <laughs> and yeah, the garden the garden wasn't tilled. We're, in, in, in the Genesis story, we're talking about a forest garden. It goes go, goes in, in, into length about how every tree is found there that bears fruit after its own kind, all that stuff, stuff like that. So we're, we're, we're already talking about a forest garden that man's supposed to be tending. <clears throat> Jasper says, no beautiful thistles. <laughs> well, 
plants like the thistle would be there, but they wouldn't be a profuse abundance, making it impossible to grow anything else. Those plants are there. They're just not a problem. They're not an issue. For example, right now I've got dandelions in the garden. There's a couple. There's not a lot. There's a few. There's enough there that the seed's there that if I ever wind up needing the assistance of a plant that will send down a deep tap root to alleviate soil compaction and bring calcium to the surface while covering the ground, the dandelion is there for me. And that is a bug trying to crawl right across my camera lens. Can you imagine? Zai Geek is with us. Low till for the win. Yeah, low till, no till. Uh, I mean, if, if you're seeding in, you kind of want to scuff up the surface so that there's something for the for the seeds to, 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 to germinate and take a grip in. Other than that, the method that we'll be using for dealing with that, that heavy clay... You know, we, you saw me last, I think it was last year, cutting it out in just blocks. It's just solid chunks of clay. That's that's what I'll, I'll be working on. But we'll, we'll take the fork and we'll get that down in there. And we'll crack holes through it. And then we'll we'll, we'll seed in with, with daikon radish and uh, sugar beet, a few other things, so that those will work on bringing organic matter down into the soil. Hmm. Almost certainly acacia, right? Anyway, yeah. So, what is it? Sasra is saying that's the herder's problem, not gardener's problem. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, sometimes it's not even a problem. Like wild chicory and dandelion are great fodder. They're good food for us too. They're good medicine. I just don't have many. Uh, yes, that the, that 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 video was entitled "Water Over the Plants." And then we got Green Greg's in the house. Hello, guys. Got to check out Greg Allison's channel. He's been tearing it up lately. Um, I I, I got to listen to him on a on on somebody else's podcast radio show not too awful long ago. I'm getting the word out about the dangers to the power grid here in the United States and elsewhere. It's kind of a problem that developed nations have. Uh, it's very, very easy to disable a power grid. If you, if you, if you put your mind to it and know what you're doing, know what to look for. And it is a vulnerability that every nation has, even the ones that, uh, how am I actually put this? It's a vulnerability that every nation has and every nation has the capacity to, exploit that vulnerability, including ones that do not have nuclear weapons. So civil behavior between nations would probably be a good idea in the modern era, if you're planning on relying upon a power grid to survive, that is. Yeah, too, too easy. Too easy. Let's see. So Zai's working with heavy clay. <laughs> Vicky's primary crop is rocks. Of course, Vicky is in in, in the uh, in the Ozark Mountains on the, the eastern slopes of the Ozarks, east side of the Ozarks. Uh oh, see, I haven't done this yet. I, I haven't tried to grow quinoa. I've eaten it a few times. It's okay, uh, but we have lots of lambs quarter too. Now, the, the amaranth that we plant, uh, sometimes I have a hard time, time telling it between it and, uh, and the red-rooted pigweed whenever they're young, because when they're young, they look identical. It just, I just have to wait for a bit until the colors start to show on the amaranth. And that, that one variety that I got to try out, the, uh, the Oshberg stuff, nice big plant, lot, big plant, lots of seeds, but, but not having that not having that color that the uh, the elephant trunk am amaranth has means I, ca I can't tell the difference between it and just com common pigweed. So, mm, sometimes if you're gonna, gonna see it in like an amaranth or something, make sure it's enough different in appearance from everything else that you can tell, tell what it is. Okay. 
Yeah, pelletized gypsum is, is a miracle worker on, on, on clay soil. They also want to make sure you, you're getting in lots of organic matter and keeping roots in the soil because the roots in the soil are continuing to feed the soil. And really, the daikon radish has been interesting for that. All right. Vicky is saying, when should you plant amaranth? Uh, start sowing it before, um, well, you can start sowing it before your last frost, but it's not going to start really popping up until after you start getting warm days. So you could wait until after your last frost, but anywhere around there. It can grow back after after you harvested all of it the year previously. Just whatever happened to fall while you were harvesting is often enough to get a patch going again. So once you've got it established, it almost doesn't matter. <laughs> He's playing three types of amaranth. I wound up with seven. <laughs> and yeah, you can plant it. Yeah, you can plant it right now. I mean, it's it's the seeds are are, are capable of sitting there, and they are not going to germinate until the time until the uh, the circumstances are right for them. Uh, what would I plant this late? Um, I've been planting cowpeas, lots and lots of cowpeas, black eyed peas. Uh, planted some peanuts. They may be late for them, but they'll still produce before the end of the season. But mainly right now, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of cow peas and, of course, maybe one last round of melons before uh, before the fall weather gets to us. And so, as we have, we're planting radish, turnip greens, and stuff like that. Yeah, all, all that stuff will, will, will grow right now. Um, I'm planting... Oh. Corn, hello. <laughs> if, you, if you planted the kind of corn I'm, I've got, then then yeah, you, you, you can plant that right now, too. Uh, 90 days is all it takes to go from seed to harvest, and probably this week I'm going to plant the beans along with it. So that's another thing that we're going to be planting. I've got some pole beans that only take about 80 days or so to, to finish up, and we're lagging those about maybe 10 days behind the, uh, the corn. And the idea is to give the corn enough time to get started before the beans can get up there and overpower it. So sometime this week, we'll drop the beans in. <laughs> yeah. We are planning on using some of those corn stalks for, for, uh, for, for Halloween decorations. Uh, I, I observed this past year that maybe seven corn stalks bundled together was selling for $15 at the home and garden center. I'm like corn stalks. I'm going to gather my corn stalks and sell them. Come, come, come fall. I think we'll do, I think we'll do uh, maybe nine stocks in a bundle and do two bundles for $20 instead of one, bu one bundle for 15. And who knows, maybe somebody will buy them. Maybe they won't. Hmm. The golden fan. Those that, that's that's the huge giant ones, kind of like an orange colored amaranth. We grew that one year. Big, 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 big plant. Big, big plant. Huge plant. Big plant. Too big. <laughs> that was too much plant for me. I like the elephant trunk better. It's a little bit more manageable. It it it, it makes seed heads that are about as broad as my chest. But they only come up to about my head, so they're a lot easier to manage. Yeah, corn and pole, be pole beans is, is is a pretty good is a pretty good uh, combination. Um, I tried early peas along with the corn this year, and they did okay. Yeah, I, I got enough to to plant another round of early peas, but they didn't really hang in. For the entire season with the corn, I'm thinking I should have done pole beans uh, this spring because the, the beans I've got are, are Cherokee Trail of Tears black bean, and they can either be picked like a green bean or you can allow them to, to, to dry on the vine and use them as a shelly bean, a soup bean. Now, the the, the thing that we're the thing that thing that we're doing uh, this the second planting, I'm I'm going to be planting the pole beans again, but. Uh, 
kitty just got into the laundry basket. <laughs> it's not my laundry. <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to be planning, planning, uh, where was that? Oh, yes. We're going to be planting pole beans in the corn this year. But what we're working on for future generations is a vining cowpea, a vining black eyed pea. I've got a couple uh, that I Burbanked. They have a vining habit. We're planting them again in the front yard along with our amaranth, and we're, we're just doing pole beans in the back. If I get enough of them together uh, for, for, for next year when we get to the summer planting, we'll put the black eyed peas, vining black eyed peas, with the, uh, with the corn. And so that will be our, our vine that goes with the, with the corn for second planting next year. So we have two plants of corn every year. And Vicky's saying, would you sell amaranth after frost for next year? I mean, yeah, if, if, if you got the spot where you want it, want it to grow at, you know, just, I'm, I'm going to do my soil prep and it's good to go. I'll just take my, my amaranth. And what you can do after, you, after, you, after it grows is cut that top off and then just take the top and just beat the ground with it. You just beat the ground with it. You can beat the ground with it any time, really. The seeds are going to come off. They'll be in the soil, and whenever circumstances are right, they'll germinate and grow. So pretty much any time. Faith is right. Any time. Any time. Um, <laughs> Y'all ever heard of high plants take more sun like corn? <laughs> yeah, we grow corn. We grow corn and sunflowers and Jerusalem artichokes and all kinds of fun stuff. Those Jerusalem artichokes get pretty big. I mean, they they get up there. Yeah, I do too, and it's it's a really nice thing to have. Um, the moment this this little side strip here and on, on on the north side of the house, uh, I went in about three feet, well, two and a half feet away from the foundation, so I left a, a strip about two and a half feet wide because. I, I can I can get down there and I can reach out and I can I can weed all the way to the foundation if I want to reach into this area like a planting bed and weed it. But I, I left myself that much space and then I dug a trench, dun, 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 right alongside the north side of the house, uh, two foot down, two foot wide. Eventually it'll be three foot wide, and I filled that up with wood chips. And on the opposite side of this is where we've got a row of cannas and um, and peanuts growing at the moment. And the peanuts are the ground cover. This is an area that gets lots of sun. The peanuts are the ground cover. The cannas are a, a starchy root crop. Um, they're used in, in Southeast Asia to make those glass noodles that are very popular. But you don't have to process them into noodles to eat them. All you really have to do is take the take the roots, either dig them up or if you, if you bring them in to store them for the winter, like you might want to do at Zone 7 and further north, you take those roots knock the dirt off of them, throw them in a pot, cover them with water, bring it to a boil, boil for about 45 minutes, remove from the heat, drain it, let it cool. When the roots are cool enough to handle, you take them and cut them in half, and then just peel that outer skin off. And the inside part, the starchy, somewhat fibrous inside part, you just take and cut it up just like you'd use potatoes for stir fry or for soup. They don't mash very well, but otherwise you use them just like a potato. They fill you up good, and they're really good. Uh, full of calories. I think it's like 370 for 100 grams. So they're on par with potatoes for calories. And well, about one square foot of ground with canna in it has got about five pounds of roots if it gets enough water through the season. They don't mind shade. They can have some shade so you can grow them with canopy over them uh, just as long as they have enough water. Each plant, at least here in Zone 7, is going to produce about 20 pounds of roots by itself. So four square foot around that one plant, 20 pounds of roots, and you can just go right down the line. Bam, 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 bam. And that's at a pound, that's around 2,000 calories of starch. So maybe mix it up, have some fat, a little bacon, squirrel meat, fish, whatever you got to go along with it. Uh, mess of collards or black eyed peas or, or what have you. The peanuts are nice for a source of protein and for oil. If you don't have any, anywhere else to get oil from, you can brush your peanuts for peanut oil for cooking your can of root in, for example. So getting those going, having a vine growing up the side of those like a black-eyed pea or possibly one of these days we'll have maybe passion fruit for, 
for, for, for a vine to grow up there. That might be nice. I'll have to check that plant out. Kenneth. <clears throat> We're growing uh, the golden fishing pole bamboo. I went and checked on it just before we got started tonight. Definitely sunflowers. Sunflowers are awesome. I have a contest going right now to see who can grow the most sunflowers. Um, if I was thinking, I'd have the link ready to show to you for the live stream where I talk about the uh, the rules for that competition. It's a one hundred dollar Amazon gift card for the uh, the contestant that produces the most sunflowers, and that's by by counting the the, st the stocks. At the, at the end of the growing season. So not number of sunflower seeds, not the amount of weight of sunflowers, but the number of sunflower stocks. That's how we're, that's how we're doing it. Let me get that, that link address real quick. And we're just gonna drop it in. I'm gonna drop it in chat. Here are the rules going through, if it will, for our contest to win a $100 Amazon gift card for doing nothing but growing sunflowers. Chances are you're growing sunflowers already, <laughs> and you just might be able to cash in. Just send me a, a the, the rules are simple. Send me a video or send me a link to the video uh, showing you planting the sunflowers, and when it's time to, time, time to harvest them, send me a video showing you counting the stocks, and whoever counts the most stocks, that's the winner. The, the idea behind this was um, we have a uh, political establishment in this country that likes to agitate and pick fights with, with foreign powers that have nuclear weapons. And those of us who are stuck in this country that don't really have a say in the matter are kind of in the firing lines. Hey, wait a minute. You're going to go off and start a nuclear war. We're going to get hit and we have to deal with the fallout. Well, if we're going to have to deal with the fallout, we need something that can actually absorb that cesium. <laughs> and sunflowers can do that. So we plant sunflowers as a protest. That was the idea. <laughs> I know what you mean. Car uh, it's not so bad. Carbs is, is, is carbs get, 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 get a bad rap. Uh, but you have to be selective about what kind of carbs you're taking in. Too many cereal grains is not good for you. We're just not designed to eat cereal grains. Those are grasses. Those grow out in the, those grow out in the savanna where the lions are. That's not our area. Our area is the forest. So we'll stick with the with the starchy tubers that have resistant starch that takes longer to to digest and in some cases takes a, a special cooperation with our our our, our gut biome. Oh. Speaking of which, guys, you don't mind just looking at the gnome for just one moment while I go grab something. I have to show you something. I was out, I was out watering uh, in, in in our raised bed area, which is what I'm working on on, on expanding right now. The, all all the stream trimming and stuff. Mary did a little cryptic video with with with, with the the cement blocks being brought in on the dolly. What's he building? What I'm building is another another raised bed area. And I'm doing all the preparation work right now to, to start building it. But while I was back there and I was watering, I came across uh, the Yacon that I've got growing. I kind of decided to experiment with this thing. I heard, heard good things about it. It's, uh, it's Melanthus sunchifolius, the Yacon. It's related to the sunflower. It comes from the Andes. But this, this plant produces tubers that are said to be sweet, somewhat like an apple or a pear for sweetness. And also has resistant starch and a form of sugar in it that your body doesn't really digest. So it tastes sweet and it fills you up, but it takes your takes your system a long time to digest uh, the, 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 the inulin, the, the special type of starch that's in it. Um, and, and also, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't have a sugar that you digest. You get sweetness without the calories, it's kind of cool. But I haven't tasted them yet. So while I was watering, uh, I noticed that there were tubers appearing above the surface of the soil. So I had to mound more soil up around them because apparently they're, they're getting to the point where they're popping out of the ground. And I grabbed one of the tube tubers and brought it in with me. I have never tasted Yacon before, but tonight 
with your kind indulgence, I'm going to go to the refrigerator where I have that tuber, break it out, and cut into it, and we'll find out what it tastes like. So hang in. I'll be right back. All right, they get bigger. They get bigger. That's 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 what we got. One tiny little tuber. This was what was poking up out of the top of the ground, and it actually looks a little bit like the the dahlia tuber, a bit. So we're gonna just go ahead and peel it first. And I'll do that by just lightly scoring the skin on the surface. All right. Kind of has a floral scent. A little floral scent. It's not bad. I could probably use a peeler to peel this instead of my fingers. I imagine blanching might be good. Kind of like whenever you do a uh, do a potato, you think it's your water boiling. And then you drop the potato in and let it boil for just a little bit. And then pull it out, immerse it in cold water. The skin slip right off. Eh. Might be able to do something like that. The, the skin does peel off kind of easily. Matter of fact, you probably. Yeah, that works. So the initial scent that I'm, I'm picking up off of this, this is yacon root. For people who are tuning in late, the initial scent that I'm picking up off of this is a little bit for a bit like a ginger. Actually, the scent kind of reminds me a bit of ginger, though this is not a Zanzibar. This is a a relative of the sunflower, oddly enough, and it grows or did grow in the Andes Mountains of South America, where it is to this day still very popular. Okay, so there we go. I have I have. Very, very quick and easy to scrape it with, with a knife on the outside to remove most of that skin. They say the skin is bitter, so you want to remove the skin. Okay. So here we have Yacon. Smolanthus sonichifolia. Sonichifolia. There we go. I'm just going to cut. I'm going to drop a chunk. I'm going to cut a little chunk off. It's a little fibrous. It tastes sweet. I mean, it tastes very sweet, like like sugar for sweetness. It's juicy. The fiber is not overwhelming. It's a little crunchy, not stringy. So a bit like a water chestnut, maybe. And actually, yeah, it's very sweet. I cut off another piece here. Look at that cross section there. So this is Yacon Smelanthus sanchifolia. Crunchy like a water chestnut. You can eat them raw, obviously. Very sweet. I like it. That's not bad. It's not bad at all. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. All right. So I'm going to put this aside. We'll enjoy more of this later. But yeah. Okay, I'll enjoy more of it now. Too very, very good. Sorry. We're going to do a little eating channel stuff. So this is an example of a, of a root crop that you could grow. Hmm. What we were talking about active versus passive pest control. Once again, going back to the pecan tree. Hmm. All right. My apologies. That's a really nice vegetable. First time ever trying it. 
Okay. Our pecan trees. Lovely trees. Lovely. They produce lots of food. By their 15th year, they'll produce about 50 pounds of nuts. And on the average, it's about 2,000 calories per pound of nuts that fall out of this tree. They'll go up by about three pounds per year on the average from there on out until they get ancient. And pecan trees can get ancient. If the conditions are right, they can live for hundreds of years. The average for most trees that aren't in ideal conditions is at least 90 or more. So big tree, lots of canopy, lots of shade, lots of nuts. But one major pest problem. Maybe two major pest problems. One major pest problem is not even one that I think about much, but people that have them report this, so I may as well pass it on to you. People complain about the honeydew from the aphids that go and mine the leaves of the tree, and so that it leaves a sticky residue on things underneath it. They don't, ah! And they have similar problems with walnut trees, too. So, apparently, if you have an issue with aphids, they can create a sticky residue raining down from your, your pecan trees. Who knew? I don't have an issue with aphids, though. And, of course, the reason I don't have an issue with aphids is because of passive pest control, where we have gone around through throughout the yard, we've set up areas where there are rock walls for habitat, places for the lizards to sun themselves, surface water for the, for, 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 for those those predator species to be able to, to go and have water. So they have water, they have shelter, the ants provide the food, and lo and behold, we have a yard full of five-line skinks and other lizards and frogs. So that's one of the reasons why we don't have honeydew or sticky sap raining down from our, our pecan trees. Now, the other big problem with pecan trees are webworms or tent caterpillars. Um, these are the things that, that come in there in the spring and sometimes in the fall, and they build these tents up inside the trees. And as you're driving down the highway, I'm sure you've seen plenty of them out there in the wild. You look out and you'll, you'll just see just masses of webs in the trees and go, what's that? What are those? Well, those are the tent caterpillars, and they can completely destroy all the foliage inside of that tent. And sometimes those tents will engulf, engulf entire trees. It's a, it's, it's a wonder that some species survive, and some species are more susceptible to others, uh, more susceptible than others to, to the action of the, the tent caterpillar. Or webworm is another word, another term for them. Fall webworm and spring webworm. It's the same same worm. It's just two different li two different uh, two different life cycles. Kind of like pigs. They have two life cycles per year. Uh, webworms do too. So how do we deal with these? Whenever these trees get oh so tall, tall to the point where I can't just spray it with something. One of the methods for dealing with webworms is to to use fire and use a torch to burn the webs out. At a certain point, they're too high up. I won't be able to reach them to burn the webs out. I won't be able to reach up there to manually pull the webs out. So all of the active control methods that I've got are not going to work, with the exception of maybe um, spraying, using an oil spray at certain times of the year to stop the, the worms from going from the ground up the tree in order to establish colonies. But I don't want to be dependent upon a pesticide spray either. And I certainly don't want my forest to look like those unincorporated and untended areas that you see driving by on the highway that are just a sea of fall webworms. That's horrible. How do I prevent that? And the, the answer actually is a form of, of uh, passive pest, pest control where I have managed to delegate the responsibility for taking care of the worms to someone else. In this particular case, I'm delegating the responsibility to the Carolina wren. It's a bird. Showed it showed in the thumbnail. And the purpose of the bird is to go and attack those webs, attack those worms, and other pests that might trouble my trees. These birds go and destroy those. And the only way I get them is by creating the environment that they feel comfortable being in. So I have to have the water that they want. I have to have the shelter that they want. And I try to provide housing for them, but the little... The silly little birds want to build their nests wherever they please, apparently. Uh, the most recent nest that I discovered of wrens was in our in our cable box on the back side of the house that was left open just a tiny little bit. They built a nest in there. In any case, 
getting these birds to come around and getting them to, to inhabit the yard has been a, a campaign and an ongoing campaign. And part of it has definitely been to get not just the wrens, but the other birds that they want to flock with, their, their buddies, their flock mates to come around. So that's cardinals and titmice and chickadees and some house finches, downy woodpeckers. Uh, we also get some pileated woodpeckers that show up as well. And you think, well, you know, the, the woodpeckers, those are those are obligate insectivores, but they also do eat sunflowers out of, out of the feeders as well. They just have a different way of doing it. A downy woodpecker will come by, grab one sunflower seed, fly over, land on the tree, and then walk around finding a place to wedge it because he wants to wedge that in, in the bark of the tree and in, in the crevice there and then tap it with his bill, pop open the nut, pull it out with his tongue. Meanwhile, since he's been walking around this tree, he's been looking and listening and checking for bugs. And he might eat the one sunflower, but he's going to work the entire tree over looking for insects. So I, I, I'm, I'm paying the, 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 the birds that are my, my workers here with sunflowers. Of course, I, I grow the sunflowers too. Um, so we do attraction of wildlife. Wildlife does the act of pest control. I do the environmental change that allows the wildlife, or in some cases, the, the flora, the trees, to do a portion of that work for me. That way I don't have to do so much work, which is good because, you know, I'm getting older. It's harder to do work. Finding that ducks do a lot of work for me is, is also a, a, a huge advantage. Corn report from Iowa. Corn got laid over twice, and the yellow corn doesn't pop back in the same way that ours does. I'll tell you what. Sassafras pulling out some interesting plants for you guys tonight, so take notes. Jewel of Opar, wonderful summer green that reseeds easily. <laughs> Greg can't text. <laughs> well, that's a concept. Yeah. What do you what do you do with a new field, new place? You just got it. You got it. Yeah. I was cycling with Mary about that early day. Said so if I had to do it all over again. Because we've been going around trying to repair our soil in patches piecemeal. If I had to do it all over again, I would I would start by just taking the plow and plowing the entire thing. I'd plow it as deep as I could possibly plow it. And then I'd, I'd disc it and then come back in a couple of weeks, wait for the seeds to sprout, and then I'd do it all over again. Roots to the sky, let them die. Roots to the sky, let them die. I'd kill everything in there. I'd roll out silage tarps and solarize and just... just annihilate everything in the soil and then immediately come back and start reintroducing everything that I want. So I'd be so on my, my cover crop of alfalfa and two or three different kinds of alfalfa, two or three different kinds of clover, um, maybe two or three different types of, of daikon radish, sugar beets, maybe some bull's blood beet too. Why not mix it up? Fennel, dill, um, sunflower, safflower. What else do we usually throw out there? those sorts of things. And I would carpet the entire area with that and then let it grow, let it grow and let it rot. Grow it all and let it rot. Let it all rot. I mean, not even harvest a bit of it. And then we'd start with the, the earthworks and the planting and everything else. So we have one entire year that we do absolutely nothing but try to fix whatever's wrong with the soil. Take out whatever's there and then put in our cover crops, and then we start shaping it into what we want. Then again, sometimes you get a place that the soil is just great to begin with, and you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Makes you wonder why they sold the place in the first place. Huh? All right. Let's see. Yes, Mary is correct. Winter wheat, the ducks didn't eat it. So you can, you can get away with growing wheat in ducks. Um, they didn't eat peanuts, which is interesting. So what we're doing with uh, with the cannas and the peanuts and some other things, squash so far have not been able to survive ducks, but sweet potatoes have, and peanuts have. And if they're far enough along, uh, daylilies and cannas and stuff like that should be able to avoid getting munched on by ducks. But you'd have to let them get up high enough that they're, they're, they're established and the ducks can't just munch on the tips and destroy them. 
if the duck can get at anything that's emerging, the duck will just keep it down. But keep them off of the stuff until it's established, and then you can let the the the, the ducks graze it. Yep. Sometimes the problem is also a solution. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Remove your bird feeder around. That's that is one way that you can do it. Yeah. Um, so that's been cutting for rabbit fodder. That's pretty good. I mean, they're uh, they're an amazing trap crop. They really are. All of your leaf foot bugs want to go to the sunflowers. Whenever those those go over there, you get the wheel bugs. The wheel bugs come over there and hunt them. Wheel bugs are one of the very few predators that you can get that will control stink bugs and leaf foot bugs. Nothing else wants to eat the stink bug, but the wheel bug doesn't have any problem. They'll just walk up to them. All right, you're mine. And they'll munch them. Carolyn is saying, I think that Brian has the most sunflowers. But yeah, but he, he already said he's not planning on counting the stocks. So as we get close to that point, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to pardon me, I had to I had, I had to scratch my nose because I'm gonna say something. I'm going to say something controversial. I, I figured out the reason I touch my nose is whenever I say something that maybe somebody's not going to like this and I might ruffle a few feathers, I, I do a little self-comforting gesture. This is, this is not my tell exactly. <laughs> I guess it is. I spent a little time in introspection last uh, live stream. About that. I thought, why do I keep on touching my nose? Um, it gets itchy. Anyway. So I'm, I'm going to, to, to try to um, make sure that I, I send an invitation to all the people that, that have entries, that, that have valid entries to the, to the contest with regards to Brian and Flannel Farms and uh, let you guys weigh in on it because it's, 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 your, it's your prize pool. And if you would like for Brian to be able to be eligible without having to manually count all of his sunflower stocks, then... Those of you who are in the running could say yay or nay, and uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. If you guys say yay, then I think Brian may win, <laughs> but I haven't seen everybody's entries yet, so it's 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 anybody's ball game right now. There we go. Yeah. One of the biomass and the sunflower planting for the soil to be broken up because they send out deep, deep tap roots and do a good job of breaking up soil. It's another reason why we include them in our in our in our mix, aside from being able to attract the beneficials that we that we want, trap crop for the for, for, for the bugs that we don't want, and that pr produces habitat uh, for the bugs that we do want. In this case, the wheel bugs, as we're not using any pesticide. It is that pretty that 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 feel just just to knock your socks off. <laughs> okay, Greg is asking about the tuber that I was munching on, which I put put to the side, right over here, and I, I peeled it earlier, so you can't. Well, you can always you can always go back and and watch the replay before before we peeled it. Had a very thin brown skin on the outside of it that we scraped off with the knife. It has a tendency to turn brown rather quickly once it's been peeled, I notice. It just the surface level oxidizes. This is called Yacon, Y-A-C-O-N, Yacon. And it is a a tuber. Slightly fibrous. Has a light floral scent akin to ginger, but it doesn't taste like ginger. It just tastes Kind of sweet. It's just sweet with a little fiber. You can cook them. Obviously, you can eat them raw. Hmm. Not bad. Not bad at all. Hmm. So, apparently, the word yakon meant water root originally, and they are. They're very. They're very full of water. Juicy. And I imagine that dietary fiber is going to do me good too. I'll tell you what, watermelon is awesome stuff. 
lots of water, perfectly filtered, electrolytes, and lots of dietary fiber. Makes your trips to the bathroom much more enjoyable. <laughs> there's there's Joe coming in late. Um, no, I don't have any tardy slips made up for your mom. Let me see here. Zaya is asking, do you harvest it after it flowers, the icon? Yeah, it, it's supposed to be harvested in the fall. I don't, the only reason I have that tuber out is because it was popping out of the ground, and I saw it and said, I have never tasted one of these before. I really want to know what it tastes like. I'm yank, yoink, and I grabbed it and, and took it in. It should get much bigger. It should, well, maybe not that big. It should get about as long as my hand. The tuber should get about hand size by the time fall arrives. And one of one of many, 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 many flowers that produces edible tubers that we that we grow, we've got um, we've got Crohn's C R O S N E S. It's a, a form of mint, Stachys affinis, is what it's called. That's the scientific name. Otherwise called mint net, mint root or Crohn's. We've got those growing. Makes a little tiny about well, whenever I got them, the size of my pinky. How big they get whenever you let them grow out the full size, I don't know. Probably still the size of my pinky. Uh, but we've got those growing. Uh, those are, are, are also kind of nutty, crunchy, um, another starchy root, all different kinds of things besides just potatoes. And many of them produce nice flowers. For example, the, the mint root makes nice flowers. Um, dahlias make nice flowers. The flowers are edible. And as it turns out, they have different flavors, which is kind of cool. And the, the tubers of the dahlia are also edible. So we'll, we'll be producing some of those. Hopefully we'll have some for sale too, um, here in the next year or two it looks like we're going to have cannas for sale uh beginning either either this winter or i don't know i, I I'm, I'm tempted to not put them up for sale until we begin approaching spring because you're going to have to keep them stored until it's time to plant them and it might be easier for me to just hold on to them and then send them out just prior, prior, prior to, to, to springtime planting. That way you don't have to worry about having that root that you're trying to keep alive throughout the winter. Um, and you can just go straight to planting and growing. Mm. So let's see. Crones, yes, we grow those. Dahlias, cannas. Daylilies have, a, have have an edible tuber as well. The Ocon, I've got some Oka, which is uh, Oxalis tuberosa. Oxalis is like wood sorrel, kind of um, an acid, sort of lemony flavor to the to the to the leaves. This one, unlike wood sorrel, uh, produces a tuber underground that you can eat as well, and it's starchy and crunchy, and it's, it's just a high calorie, high calorie tuber. So we have those. Um, I don't know if you call peanuts a. A flowering plant. Sweet potatoes are though. <laughs> we grow sweet potatoes, and you can eat sweet potato leaves as well. So there's there's all kinds of of, of great stuff that you can be growing in a forest garden in your front yard. Uh, just our recent video, we didn't even get all the way around the the, the, the the front yard garden. We just hit a few highlights on on the way. Uh, what did we not show? We didn't show the canaguaca, which is like this zone ten perennial that's growing here for some reason. Uh, we didn't show the elderberry. We didn't show all the grapes that are coming on. Uh, we didn't show the the, the, the blackberries. Uh, I don't think I went into any detail about the uh, about the, the scarlet runner beans that we had growing. Not, well, I don't think we covered any of that stuff. So, I mean, just that, that little front yard postage stamp, front yard garden tour. I didn't even show you everything. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can grow. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and watch the first part too because Sasprass have been been dropping plant names. <laughs> I've got to go look them up. Uh, just mention that uh, I've I've got some and I don't know how well it's doing. I got I got two plants. I got one yokon and two and two oka to plant, and the oka uh, the the yokon is doing fine. It got a little bit wilty because I forgot that bed and didn't water it. 
<laughs> Meanwhile, the uh, the onions that were in that bed, after I threw in some 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 worms and worm dirt, uh, instead of going, yeah, we don't like it here, went zing, we like it here. So you know, the, the Asian jumping worm strikes again. Apparently, that's all those beds needed to perk them up. They needed microbial life. The nutrients were in the soil; they just couldn't plants couldn't get them because they didn't have microbes to carry them. So adding the, the earthworms tilled the soil for me and introduced the mi the microbes and now my, my raised bed with the with the onions is taking off. But the Ocon the Ocon was doing fine uh, before that. Still doing fine. Um the Oka not so much. It it it's probably likes a bit more shade than it was getting there. So it grew for a bit, it made some tubers and we'll, we'll see if they, they respout and regrow, and I might move them around to other locations and experiment uh, with them a bit further. Let's see. Joe is saying, Yukon, Himika, and something else was recommended by John Kohler of Growing Your Green. Yeah, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen that channel a time or two. Um, Food te te teaser like the guy who eats random fruit. You're talking about uh, Weird Explorer. Weird Explorer is one of those those interesting channels, right? Uh, the guy's profession, the, what 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 he, what he ordinarily does is he's a contortionist, uh, circus performer, you know, carny stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not really all that interested. I mean, I, I, I I'm I'm mildly interested because of uh, of, of of past work as a carny. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm only a little bit interested, but I really wouldn't go watch a, a contortionist perform. That's background scenery. But while he was out performing, he went by one of these markets and he found a bunch of fruit, took it back to his, to his hotel room and said, okay, I'm going to try this fruit. He videoed recording, eating the fruit and getting his impressions of it. And that just went viral. And he said, huh. I guess people want to see me eat fruit. And so now he, he eats unusual, rare, exotic fruit, vegetables, and other things that you may not have ever had the chance to see in a supermarket before. And really, whenever I'm looking through Plants for a Future, PFAF, that particular database, and I see an edible somewhere that I've never seen in a supermarket before, and I'm wondering, eh, what's this thing taste like? Is it something I might want to try, or is it something I'm going to not like at all? Is there, you know... Has somebody done a review of this? Can I get a, an idea of what this tastes like? I can go to his channel, and there's a good chance. There's a good chance he's tasted it, and he can tell us what it tastes like. So I kind of like that channel. Anyway. And people send him stuff, too. So um, I might have to send him a few things that we're growing. Hmm. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, they are my favorite nut too. Um, I mean, I like almonds, but but definitely pecans are are, are, are right up there at the top. I mean, just I grew up with a with a pecan orchard, and being able to see how much food these trees could produce year in year out, constantly with little or no input on, on, on the part of, of the humans that are that are tending them. I mean, pretty much all you have to do is make sure that you can harvest. So you make, you've got to make sure the ground stays clear so you can harvest. Now, everything involved with making sure that the ground stays clear can and may include um, pasturing livestock, planting crops in between the rows of your trees. It's called alley cropping. Um, you might have a, a, a permanent food forest. You may have sweet potatoes growing there. You can have peanuts growing there. You can have cannas growing there. All this stuff can grow under the shade of, of, of a pecan tree, case in point, see my front yard. Uh, and so you, there's there's no reason to say, well, I've got these pecan trees. That's the only thing I'm growing here. Get rid of that mindset. I mean, big orchards do work that way. But keep in mind, those big orchards are also only interested in harvesting that one crop they sell that one crop and they're happy with that one crop. Well, you can grow a lot more than that one crop. All right. Joe's wondering if Yocon would taste great with red chili powder, salt, and lime juice. 
you know, just about everything tastes great with red chili powder and lime juice. Don't forget the cilantro. All right. Bringing it down, bringing it down. There's the thing you can do right there. Use, using the uh, Bacillus turbingensis. Thurbingensis. Uh, I can't pronounce it properly. That thing. <laughs> now, it'd be it'd be a trick if we could figure out how we can how we can culture it, grow it, propagate the bacterium, so that we don't have to to keep on buying product over and over again. Let's see. Ken's super late. Green says he's going to go go live in the wee hours tonight. All right, I'll I'll stay up, I'll stay up for that, or I'll take a nap and get up later. I don't know what to do. I've missed too many live streams. I like being in the lives whenever you're doing. <laughs> Last year we tried to keep the tomatoes and peppers weeded. They were destroyed by pests and diseases. This year we let the weeds proliferate, and they're flourishing. One thing you do have to do is make sure you get get cleared out around around the plants so that things like blister beetles and grasshoppers don't use the grass surrounding them as as, as a habitat. That's that's one thing you do want to do. Um, you remove the grass from around around your other plants. The grasshoppers don't have the shelter, then they won't concentrate on the things that are surrounded by tall grass. Other than that, yeah, let let let's let let, let the roots stay in the ground. Maybe cut your grass back so it doesn't grow tall. And then you can always compost your, your, your cuttings, leave the roots in the ground. If you're going to pull the roots out, replace them with something. And what, this is one of the big problems that I, I see a lot of places. Fairly big channels, too, that, that, that grow gardens, conventional gardens on a regular basis. I look at their soil and I just, like, wow, your poor soil. It's so dead. <laughs> How are you growing anything? And, of course, they're, 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 they're bringing out the, the fertilizer and they have to bring out the, the pesticide and they have to spray surround and they have to they have to keep on applying these products to, 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 to their garden because they don't have any biological activity in the soil. So they don't have the bacterium delivering nutrients to the plants. They have to add fertilizer. Ugh. The trick is trying to strike a balance. See, whenever you optimize your ecosystem, whenever you stimulate your ecosystem, yes, you have bugs. Yes, you have plants that you didn't plant that may be inconvenient for you. But at the same time, you have the things that eat those bugs. And you have places and things that you can do. You have places that you can dispose of those plants and things that you can do with them that provide you with a benefit. So even your weeds wind up feeding your garden. And you don't have weeds anymore. You just have something we're just going to need to manage here in a different way. Uh, so we're, we're in the process now of, of changing out one type of ground cover, grass, for something that we find a bit more useful to us. There you go. Uh, that is a Carolina wren, yes. Oh, wrens. Lovely birds. A little bit. A little bit weird where they like to, to put their nests. <laughs> there's there's squirrel and then there's squirrel. And I, it just might be me, but I, I think the ones that, that have been eating lots of mulberries and sweet nuts taste better. Either that or get more satisfaction with knocking them out of the trees and eating them. Because those are my mulberries and my nuts. <laughs> yeah, real quick here. Let me go grab. Uh, let me go grab a link. You saw Green Gregs in our chat. Green Gregs. There he is. Green, Jig, Green Greggs is a worm farmer, but he is also an honest to goodness rocket scientist. Can you imagine that? Oh, really? A rocket scientist. He, he is an engineer with 
with uh, specialized knowledge in avionics, which is the, the portion of the rocket that I don't know how to make. I mean, I do know my way around the soldering iron, but I'm, 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 not, I'm not an engineer. Oh, yeah. Very important thing. Have lots of water. Lots of water. Um, once again, even some big channels, gardening channels, uh, go, go in, in, into the active methods that they use to keep the birds from coming along and eating their fruit. Uh, everything up to and including you know, netting over, over their trees. Can you imagine trying to net every single tree on your property and you have 500 acres? I mean, Having one acre and trying to net every tree on your property is an almost impossible concept. I mean, for practical purposes. But there are ways you can stop the birds from eating your fruit. Pardon me. There are a few birds that are going to eat fruit as a matter of course. Things like Orioles, they eat fruit. But most of the other birds, whenever they eat your fruit, it's not because, oh, I want to eat your fruit. They'd rather have a nice juicy bug. They might like to have some seeds or something of that nature. The reason they were eating your fruit is because they were thirsty and there was not enough water nearby for them, so they were getting a drink. And water out of fruits and water out of vegetables is some of the best water on earth. Can you blame them? So just providing surface water, lots of springs or or, or ponds, bird baths, if you're in a tiny, tiny little space and you don't have anything else you can do, provide the creatures that are coming, coming to visit your, your garden with a source of water and then they can do some of the work for you. Wheel bugs. Wheel bugs are uh, also called assassin beetles. And Mary got a pretty good close up shot of them. Um, not the last, not the last video, but the one before. Hang on a second. Let me let me go look at the videos. I'll drop a I'll drop a link for one where I got a good close up picture of one. I believe yes, here it is. Let's delete forever. No, get shareable link. Yes. So this video here was talking about using sunflowers for pest control and. Of course, part of the reason that we're using sunflowers for pest control is as a trap crop and to, to provide the habitat for wheel bugs. We got a good picture of a wheel bug, nice up close, so you can you can see what they look like. And whenever whenever you see one for the first time, you're like, wait a minute. What? Whenever they're young, especially, it's hard to tell the difference between them and a leaf footed bug or a stink bug, except their their mouth parts. They have a foldable mouth part called a rostrum have you guys ever seen um that that movie starship troopers poor adaptation of highlands work but starship troopers the the brain bug that little thing that it pops out that pops into the guy's head and sucks his brains out that thing that's called a rostrum well it's a real thing and it's oddly enough used pretty much the way the fictional bug views it in the movie it's used to puncture a hole into it through the carapace of its prey so they can suck out the soft insides that's how it how it feeds and one of the things that it feeds on is stink bugs and it's one of the few things that will feed on a stink bug mary says she'll try to get some more bug footage she's got a lot better luck at taking high resolution video than i do Nine times out of ten, I'll see the I'll see whatever it is I want to take video of, and by the time I've got the camera out set up, it's gone. Sorry, um, like that's the sunflower video. I, I had to get stock footage of a finch eating sunflower seeds because the ones that we have flew off before I got the camera set up to to show what they were doing. So I just I was able to show you the sunflower seed head later. Like, see, here's where he landed. Here's where he perched. There's where the seeds came out. That's how he gets them. But he, he was gone before I got the footage, unfortunately. But the the, the goldfinches that we have are the like the yellow and black ones that fly through here, and they just fly through. They're migratory; they don't they don't stay in nests. So they're 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 mendicants. 
<laughs> coming along and eating my sunflowers and then running. But they're pretty yellow birds. You know, we get we get pretty yellow birds coming through here from time to time. I guess it's okay. Sometimes we get pretty little blue birds and pretty little red birds. And we even have a pretty little green bird or a bird that has some green on it still that come through. We don't have the Carolina parakeet anymore, but but we do have indigo buntings, or not indigo. Yeah, we have indigo, but we also have uh, painted buntings, and they have every color of the rainbow on them. But once again, yeah, they fly through, they eat my sunflowers, and then they take off. If I'm lucky, if I'm really lucky, I might get a picture of one before they're gone. Grainy and out of focus, kind of like a UFO. But they're real. <laughs> they're real. They just don't hang around long. There you go. Tell Brian he used to cut those stocks and count them for his rehab. <laughs> that would be just me. I, I joke about making him laugh, but I don't want to because that's painful when he got stitches. Uh, I have been told, yes, they do make an edible flower like a starchy inside to the stock. I don't know. I'll have to experiment with it to find out. Um, but yeah, they can definitely be trellises for, for, for beans. They certainly are trellises for morning glories, even though I'm trying to get rid of the morning glories. They just keep on coming back. The Brian we're referring to, of course, is Brian at Flannel Farms. Do please check them out. They're in Virginia. That's uh, David the Good's brother. And he is also a good guy. Let's see here. He's okay. He got out of surgery fine, and, and he's back home, as far as I know, unless something else happened. But yeah. <laughs> okay, I know where we're at, champ. Hey, there's a what is that? Second cousin twice removed, or something of that nature. <laughs> Hi, Paul. How's it going? Uh, yeah, I'm still alive. I'm probably gonna probably gonna hang it up before too long. I'm just like looking for the bottom of the chat right now. Oh, yeah, that that post is stamped. So Mary, Mary was my camera woman, and by the time we got back around to the caster beam, I was like, oh yeah, we're gonna go inside. We're not gonna bother with everything that's 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 growing on the grape arbor. That'll be. The grapes will be further along next year, and, we, and we'll show you the grape arbor next year. I guess that'll be good. There'll be three-year-old grapes. We've got uh, uh, bronze muscadines, or scuppernongs, is what they're also called. Two different varieties of those. That is another Conrad. That's right. But but uh, Paul is, Paul is uh, related further back. Like his branch of the family is is is, is related to to, I guess um, Chester and and Carol's other siblings. Nice, Greg's gonna get back to selling worms in a week or two. <laughs> I got worms. <laughs> All right, let me get down here. Oh my goodness, so much chat. I want some shrimp. <laughs> I looked into growing freshwater shrimp. Like I would love to have shrimp. Uh, I'm not. I'm not quite there on my journey to develop freshwater shrimp for, for for home eating yet. I still want to though. Let me see. Yes, yeah, the assassin bug does does it does that while they're still alive. It's not it's not a pleasant way to die. Woohoo! Yeah, Brian's taking off fast. That's awesome. All right. 
Vicky says, we have a plethora of wild grapes, so I hope to try tame grapes next year. But that's not how it turns out. We've got one wild grapevine that's trying to, uh, to to take over some some red buds over there on the one side. And it never produces anything. But now that I've got both male and female grape plants, I'm wondering if maybe that's a female vine and it needed a pollinator to make anything. Let's see if it makes something. And I guess we'll see if it makes something. If it doesn't make anything this year, then I'll try to get rid of the darn thing. If I can, that may be a tall order. I've got wild grapevines popping up all over the place, as a matter of fact. I was walking around and finding them in places that I did not plant them. And I don't know whether those are... <laughs> I don't know where they came from. This is the problem. At a certain point, your forest starts planting itself. Um, the, the, the passive bit... Uh, where where we, we set things up so that the environment takes care of a certain number of tasks and chores for us. One of them eventually winds up being planting. And at a certain point, if you have the room to expand your food force, then all you really need to do is go out there and go, okay, is this a tree or a plant or a bush that I want to be here? Or do I want something else to grow here? I think we're going to knock this one down, make some space. Uh, there's a little pecan tree that's trying to grow. We'll let it grow up. And you have a pecan tree shoot up there. And you got rid of maybe some elms or something. Yeah, if, you, if you've if you got wild grapes that are producing, there's nothing wrong with having some wild grapes. We just have the one vine, and I think it was a female, and it was not getting pollinated. Well, Greg, Vicky wants to know if you got horseradish. Vicky, I got horseradish. What do you want to know? I'm trying it. I'm not saying I'm any good at growing it, but I'm trying it. Hmm. Oh, Mary says she's killed mint. <laughs> Couldn't kill that grapevine. I haven't been able to kill it, kill it either. Keep on cutting the thing back. It just keeps on coming up. It wants to live. It wants to live desperately. If it produces fruit with a, with, 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 with a male plant to pollinate it, then I'll be happy to have that. That wild grapevine, but if it never produces anything, I want to get rid of it anyway, guys. It is an hour and a half that we've been doing this thing. This one to put that bug in your ear, start thinking in terms of stimulating your ecosystems and increasing the diversity of them so that you can get a lot more, a lot more helpers to take care of these garden tasks for you. Think in terms of. What is this tree or what is this plant doing for the soil? What's it doing for the ecosystem? Think in terms of what is this animal or this insect, this bird, whatever it is. What's it doing for the ecosystem? And wherever possible, whenever you can increase the layers, whenever you can increase the diversity of species that you have interacting, those self-regulating mechanisms will take over. And all you need to do is tend, manage, and draw your harvest in the proper season. That's a lot less work than everything that you've got to do in chemical farming. And that's where we're going to leave it at tonight. Guys, thank you very, very much for joining us. If you found this video informative or entertaining, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, bang the notification bell, click all. Check out some of our affiliates. If you check on our on our, on our our homepage, you'll see an about section or would you like to know more? It's entitled. You'll see a whole bunch of channels, including Green Greg's, David the Good, and others excellent gardening channels. You'll learn a lot from these people. I know I have. But anyway, that's all I've got for you tonight. As always, found a video of entertaining. You know what to do. I will catch you next time. Get out there and get growing.